Welcome back to part two of our conversation with Mike McCallowitz, where he tells us how to cater to your best clients rather than your worst, as well as explains Parkinson's Law and how that pertains to your business. Don't go anywhere. Part two is coming up next. Welcome to this edition of Peak Performers Podcast with your host, Thor Conklin. Thor will be sharing the necessary tools, strategies, and psychology you'll need to become a peak performer in any area of your life or business. Thor Conklin here. We give you the tricks, the tips, the tools, the strategy, the technology, and the psychology peak performers use in order to get more done and execute at the highest level. If you know what to do but struggle with getting it all done or simply want to raise your game to the next level, this podcast is for you. Sit back and enjoy. I want to uh, transition just a uh, minute here. I want to talk a little bit about the pumpkin plant. First of all, what, amazing author, by the way. I, you know, I read, obviously, both the uh, Profit First and the uh, Pumpkin Plan. I did not read the Toilet Paper Entrepreneur. And was, when I was preparing for this uh, interview, I'm like, damn it, I didn't, you know, I, there's a book out there by this guy. I haven't read it yet. So I've got to read the uh, Toilet Paper Entrepreneur as oh, well. But the Pumpkin Plan, give us a little bit of a basis of what that book's all about. Yeah, so... Every book I've written, I have a new book. Uh, I just finished the manuscripts last night and uh, submitted it to my publisher. It's called Clockwork. Every book I write um, comes out of uh, a challenge that my readers are facing in the moment, but also a challenge I faced myself and I'm trying to resolve myself. So the first book I wrote was The Toy Paper Entrepreneur. I wrote it, uh, knock on wood, it, it, it got traction in a kind of cult-like way. Uh, uh, certain types of entrepreneurs are reading it. And I went to my reader base and said, hey, what's the challenge you face now? And they said, I'm struggling to grow. I'm struggling with organic growth. H how do I grow my business? And so I said, okay, that's the challenge that was put out there. The thing I do as an author that's maybe a little atypical is first I'll look for solutions often in nature. I, I believe that nature already has all the answers uh, and we just need to discover them and apply them to our business. Um, so when it came to the, to the pumpkin plan, I, by a strange confluence of events, was put in front of pumpkin farmers. I found that amongst pumpkin farmers, there's a small faction called colossal pumpkin farmers. Um, well, we call them that. They, they call themselves the lords of the gourds. <laughs> <laughs> I know. They're total geeks. But um, this small faction pumpkin farmers has figured out a kind of a process or a method that they follow that results in these pumpkins that grow the size of like cars they're massive and it's only the, the, the irony is there's only subtle changes from ordinary pumpkin growth so i studied what they did for about a year i'm i'm kind of translating it to business i test out my business and i'm like holy smokes that this works for me started testing with some friends uh some of their businesses and then said okay and then this has got to become the thesis for the book ultimately wrote the book what I discovered is there's a certain sequence of steps we can go through that result in organic explosive growth. And I'll gladly share all the steps if you want, but I just want to give kind of the, the core essence of it. Most businesses apply, uh, or the 80-20 rule, the Pareto principle, is applicable to our business. It means that in one application of it, 20% of our client base is yielding 80% of our profitability. Therefore, if that's true, and it's true for most businesses, we need to focus on that 20% of clients and replicate them. Here's what's interesting. Most businesses uh, are actually replicating their worst clients, those clients that, are, that don't pay well, that are never satisfied with our product or service. We actually get more of those clients than any other, other type of client. And the reason is because we focus our attention on them. That client that's not satisfied calls up, uh, pissed off. We, as the owner of the business, immediately call them back. I'm so sorry you're having a bad experience. And we cater to them. Um, well, well, guess what? Once you cater to a specific community, other people in that community will be magnetized by this. They'll come to you. So literally, we care for our crap customers. And those crap customers are telling their friends, you wouldn't believe this. I treat this company like total crap. I don't even pay the bills. And I get the president talking to me and caring for me. you got to work with them too. So businesses unintentionally are attracting these, what I call these little pumpkins, these, 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 these poor customers, where if we simply redirect our attention to our best customers, Uber cater to them, we can start cloning our best customers. And when we start doing that, it will start 
this this tremendous windfall of organic growth. That's the very simplified version of it. Yeah, it reminds me of uh, Jack Welsh, where he has that system of 20, 70, and 10, uh, where he ranks employees. And the, 20, the top 20%, he's figuring out how to nurture them, how to grow them, how to make them better. And then the 70, trying to figure out how to get them into the 20%. And then cutting the waste, which is the last 10%. They're just not yes. a good fit. Um, yeah. and, and some people are so offended by that because it's like, well, you know, everybody matters. But not everyone's a good fit for your firm. And, and as entrepreneurs, so often, where do we spend our time? With the problem child, right? Trying to figure yeah. out how to get them you know to be part of the culture and we love them and nurture them and meanwhile they have no interest whatsoever and they're just draining everything resources and emotions yeah it's it's unbelievable but that's exactly what happens and i, I just want to go to that point of being cold or callous um you know, it's funny. When I call a customer a bad customer, I am not suggesting that they're bad people. I'm just suggesting they're a bad fit. Um, and here's a great example. When I wrote The Pumpkin Plan, I, I started meeting with EOers. I know you're an EOer. Uh, I'm also an EOer. I met with a forum and sat down with these guys. We went through the pumpkin plan process, and this, this one company implements it. The first guy's name, the guy, uh, his first name is Joe in, in particular. And he went through this, and he evaluated his clients and determined – he sold like these tchotchkes, these like plastic bracelets and different things that you could buy at a Walmart or a dollar store. Well, his client, his number one client on his list based upon revenue was Walmart. Um, and it ended up they were the bad client. So it's not always these kind of bottom feeders, if you will, the ones that, that don't even pay you or are very little revenue. Walmart was number one in the revenue category, but the problem was the specificity of their requirements was so extreme that he couldn't comply often and got penalized or lost money on these projects. Once he realized his true best customer, uh, what he started doing was to cater to them. Now, the point is, when you sort out your customers this way, I'm not saying you know speak poorly of your bad customer, albeit you know, this could be Walmart or someone else, uh, and I'm not even saying fire them. All I'm saying is Uber catered to the true natural best. And what Joe did is one of my favorites. He, he set up a sign in his little office. He had you know 10 employees. And he said, our policy here is always to answer the phone on the first ring. If the first call comes in from the dollar store, who is now identified as truly his best customers. They didn't buy as much, but they were very profitable and loved working with them. He said, when they call, answer the phone on the first ring, take their order, and as you're on that, taking that order, if Walmart calls, let them go to voicemail, which you kind of expect that. The, the second part of his statement was the kind of the mind blower. He said, when the phone rings, uh, and it's Walmart, answer the phone the first ring, start taking their order. If while you're on the phone with Walmart, car ID pops up and it's a dollar store, immediately, without question, hang up on Walmart, tell them there's an emergency, and take the order from the dollar store. And this little tweak that he made started to result in a prolific change for his business. He was like a three to five, four million dollar business at this point. It became a five, ten. I think it only took four years. He, it was twenty-seven million before he sold it. And to get to three million, the company was owned by his family prior. It took, I think, twenty years to get to that level. This one little subtle change of prioritizing the true number one resulted in, you know, magnificent growth, healthy growth. Fascinating, you know. And in the pumpkin uh, analogy in, in the book, the farmers actually remove all the other pumpkins from that. Uh, stem or, or that particular plant so all the nutrients and all the attention goes into that one pumpkin that they feel is the number one is that correct that's correct yeah. that's correct right so so the lesson here is this is uh, when we had the discipline to say no to uh, what's really truly not opportunities it avails us our time and energy I mean think about how many times have you gone to bed with it when you're that bad customer and your mind is just racing like god they suck and this is so bad and what am I gonna do to fix this could you imagine you don't have to worry about that at all what would your mind be doing it probably be saying oh here's another way to improve my business oh here's what else I can do so when you remove that negative energy if you will of the bad customer it avails you to focus on the growth of your business uh, you rechannel the nutrients and the health yeah. if you will of the pumpkin to the right to the right pumpkins you know, you touched on a piece that we talk about all the time, and that is the ability to say no. The entrepreneurs that truly have amazing businesses really know how to say no, and that's really their default. How do you say no, and how do you determine what to say yes to? Yeah, so saying no uh, is not not easy in any regard. Uh, what 
what I've done and helped develop for myself is is that tagline we talked about, eradicating entrepreneurial poverty. I always start off with that. So in my business, um, when when an opportunity knocks on my door, and it happens all the time, uh, you know, it's one of the weird things about being an author is I'll get business owners calling me saying, hey, listen, I just want you as a partner in my business. What do I have to do? How much equity do you want? It's kind of weird. Um, but in the, the past, I'm like, oh, this is awesome. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. I realize it dilutes me. So I always ask myself, if I took an opportunity like this, first of all, is it congruent with my mission? What's, what gives me excitement? Is it eradicating entrepreneurial poverty? And most businesses really aren't in that alignment with that. And I'm not saying they're bad businesses. They're just a bad fit for me. So that's been a very powerful kind of rule. The second thing is I've come up with, I call them immutable laws, core values. It's interchangeable. But certain kind of guidelines and rules for myself. I have a a rule I call no dicks allowed. And uh, (laughs) what I mean by that is I'm not going to do business with dicks. I have. Um, it, it's it, it could make money, but it, it eats away at my soul. And that rule applies to me. I will not be a dick. Like I, I have been, and it's just unacceptable for me. So I evaluate. You know, I put myself in a potentially dickish situation. Uh, am I putting myself in a situation where uh, where money isn't valued? I call it blood money. Another rule of mine. I really value uh, value the flow of money. It's not being not being a Scrooge here, uh, but I do believe in frugality and and channeling money to to improve my business prudently. And so I evaluate based on all these parameters. And then the last question I ask is. Does this complement my existing base, or is it going to take me away from it? If it complements it, and everything else is aligned, this is finally an opportunity. If it's going to with distract from what I'm doing now, and it's not a complement, probably not an opportunity. And quite frankly, this evaluation takes so long that the initial spike of enthusiasm and excitement when a new opportunity comes in is always exciting. Yeah, um, it's that cocaine, if you will, or yeah. that, that adrenaline shot. But I go through this evaluation process. I lose my enthusiasm, which is a good thing. If I still have my enthusiasm after all that, well, then it's a good opportunity. There's very few that are good after all for me. Yeah. I like that. You you understand what your North Star is, and you're always making sure that you're in alignment with that. I actually have on my desk a compass, one of those uh, kind of nautical oh, compasses. Cool. And it's just yeah. a metaphor for me that, that you know, there's there's a North Star, there's there's a there's a direction in which I'm headed, and it's really easy to get off track. Um, you, you, you grew uh, – did you grow up in Jersey? I know you live there I now. I did, I did. Okay, yeah. so I grew up on the Jersey Shore. And I was five years old and I was boating. You know, I think I grew up on a boat or or was born on a boat. And if you've ever uh, done any boating, it's, you know, you're constantly off track and you constantly have to readjust. And the entrepreneurs that I see that, again, are just killing it, they know Mm -hmm. what their North Star is and they're constantly readjusting. They're tracking, measuring, and readjusting. and they're making sure that they're protecting, well, their bottom line, which is now, you know, their, their profitability. What? Uh, Where did you grow up in the shore, by the way? Uh, Oceanport. Nice. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Your Keyport, I think. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Just a little bit uh, south of that. Yep. Great. Great place to uh, to grow up. So let's talk about a little, when you were. Uh, since we're talking about childhoods here, what are some of the yeah. things that you learned early on in your career? that you either had a mentor or someone that kind of gave you some guidance along the way. What are some of the lessons that you learned? Uh, you know, my mom gave me a good one that, that stuck with me. You know, once you commit, be a man of your word. I, I joined uh, the football team my freshman year in high school because that's what all the you know cool kids were doing, and I desperately wanted to be cool. Uh, but I was this lanky, skanky kid. And... Uh, I got beat up on the field. Like I, you know, I, I could run fast, but God forbid someone hit this twig, I would snap. <laughs> and uh, so midway through the season, with a busted up elbow and stuff, I told my mom, like, I'm quitting. Like this is, it's, it's, it's painful. It hurts. And I even played the card. Like, mom, it's a dangerous sport, right? My mom didn't want me playing at all because of its danger. But she said, no, Mike. Once you commit to something, there's other people depending on you. Regardless of how good or bad of a player you are, you've made a commitment, and the team. Uh, is it's valuing or benefiting from that? She says you'd never quit when you when you commit, never quit when you commit, and that has caused two things in me. One is uh, I, I don't quit on things. 
you know, I decided to become an author 10 years ago. It has been a grueling process. The rewards and the recognitions really only happened in the last year. Uh, and some people from the outside who do discover me say, wow, you came out of nowhere in overnight success. It's been gru- brutal. But I kind of have this once I commit, I'm not going to quit mentality. The second thing is the flip side of that is uh, I'm very selective who I commit to. Uh, I used to say, oh, yeah, yes, yes, yes. I, I was a yes man. I, yeah, I'm in anything. But realize that uh, saying yes starts diluting me. I, I'm committing to too many things. So that's been big. One other thing that's, that's just kind of stands out, I had a business mentor. His name is Frank. He's quite elderly now. I'm trying to actually get together with him for lunch, and it's just tough to even communicate with him because he doesn't use email, at least effectively. He responds like once every six months. Um, but he's an, he's an extraordinary guy. And when he was an active coach, we went out to lunch one day and I was asking about my business and I was kind of targeting a new community and I said to Frank, hey, what should I do to target this community? How can I sell to them? And his response totally caught me off guard. He said, I'm going to tell you my answer, but I don't want you to listen to it because he said, this is my answer, not your community's answer. And then he went on and just said, here's what I think may happen. But then he explained, it's a shame that a lot of entrepreneurs listen to experts and coaches and think their their opinions are divine. He goes, the only divine opinion is that of the customer themselves. So we need to go out to the people we're targeting and ask them, is this what you're gonna buy? And he goes, the only way to ask them is by having them open their wallets. You know, words are just opinions or just feelings in the moment. They'll say stuff just to make us feel good. But people don't tre- speak the truth through their words, they speak the truth through their wallets. So he directed me always go to the customer have the customer prove they want what you have to offer by opening your wallets and if I can't get a customer to open to my wallet my idea is not good enough my product is not good enough my my service is not good enough let's talk on the on this note I want to talk a little bit about I don't know if you're like I am but I'll walk down a street and I'm constantly looking at different businesses and going Okay, let me see. Square foot, they're paying this. Person, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. I, mean, I don't. I don't know if I'm the, like the only entrepreneur that is uh, caught up in this cycle, but I'm constantly evaluating everybody else's business and making judgments about. It. I'm like, what were they thinking when they opened that shop or that business? Yeah. You know, again, you're all about profitability. I'm about profitability. You need the yeah. profits in order to drive the business. Yeah. Um, what do you tell people when you go in and you see a business and you just want to shake your head and go, ooh, low profit margin, <laughs> big overhead, you know, ooh, trendy yeah. environment? What do you tell them? Yeah, so I don't say a word. I bite my tongue because I think unsolicited advice is the worst advice in the world. I can only disconnect with this person. So what I try to do is someone that I see that who could be struggling, I'll say, hey, if you ever – are, are, are looking for a shoulder to cry on or you're looking to kind of throw some ideas around or just to celebrate what the wonderful things you're doing here. Uh, I'm a guy in town or in, or in the area and I'd love to talk with you. Because here's the thing. Uh, first of all, I, I realize now what entrepreneurial poverty is. That guy with that business is putting on an air of success. So if I tell him, oh, you got all the square feet, you must be really dying, he's gonna, he'll probably say, no, who the hell are you? It, uh, the second thing is, un, you know, EO, unsolicited advice is the worst advice because it gets rejected. Yeah. People are only willing to listen to experience, you know, gestalt theory as I talk about, but but experience sharing when they're open to it and asking for it. So that's what I try to do with those people. I, I, on the flip side, I do do these calculations in my head and I'm like, that business, no way it's making money. That guy must be bankrupt by now. You know, I walk down the street right here in this town. I'm in Boonton, Main Street, New Jersey. And in Boonton, um, I have these businesses. I, I suspect they're they're living off of loans and, and begging for family for money. There, there's no way these restaurants can uh, can be making any money. And it, it kills me. It kills me. At the same time, I know I can't convince them that they're doing something wrong until, until they finally paint themselves in such a corner that, that they feel the the financial heart attack or whatever the, whatever the analogy is here, but they feel the pain that they're finally willing to correct it. You know, that unsolicited advice just never seems to, to get anywhere. Yeah. And the area that you're talking is a very affluent area. There's plenty of money to be had. I mean, you could make a very successful business out of it. Unbelievable. Yeah, but I would say one out of 10 businesses. Well, actually, there was a statistic I heard thrown around, 
And I don't even know the exact source, so just take this as hearsay, but I do believe in the accuracy of it. I heard that 83% of small businesses, and small business defined by the SBA is a company that does $25 million in annual revenue or less, that 83% of small businesses are surviving check to check, which means when you walk down any town street and you're looking at all these businesses, you know, eight out of 10 of them, one out of every four businesses are dying, are dying. Well, actually one out of every five businesses are dying. Um, so it, it's a shame, but it's the, it's the reality. Even though where we are in New Jersey, we happen to be in a very affluent area, these businesses, it's not a question about the money, it's not a question about the, the customers. There's another challenge going on um, that the business owner needs to fix, but often will be blind to it. They'll just keep on bashing their, you know, they're trying to put a hole in the wall, they bash their head in the wall and say, God, I'm just getting a headache doing this. And instead of grabbing a hammer, they actually keep bashing their head against the wall. Yeah. Yeah. And this is where the profit first uh, system comes in and, and is a game changer. If you're taking, even if it's 5% profits off the top and you're taking those, you're putting them into a separate account and you're banking those and you're keeping those and you're operating your business off of 95%, look, if you can, whatever you're spending, whatever you're operating your business on right now, I guarantee you, if you carve out a percentage, put it to profits, you'll find a way to continue to make the business work based on the lower number. It's just, it's, it's kind of like when you go away on vacation, right? It's when you leave, you've got two days left before you leave on vacation. How productive are you in the, the next two days? extremely productive oh extremely right yeah right because you know, that's all that that's all you have i got two days i got to make this thing happen in two days when you only have 80 cents instead of a dollar you make it work so there was this uh there's this thing called parkinson's law and uh parkinson was a theorist from the 1950s really a modern day philosopher and he studies uh human behavior and, and what he's fam fabled for is his theory of our relation to supply and basically what he says is human nature, as the supply for something increases, our consumption or demand of it increases. And as it decreases that supply, our demand for it decreases. His classic example is with time. If you and I are negotiating a contract and I tell you, hey, Thor, I'll get you that uh, contract in about a week. Is that okay? And you say yes. It probably will take me a week to get done. But if you and I, the same guys, have the same conversation about the same thing, the only variable that changes is I say I'll get to you in one, one day. Chances are I will get to you one day. Less time, I use it more prudently. So the the interesting thing about Parkinson is this doesn't just apply to time, it applies to all resources. And so when it comes to money, is when we have less money available to us, we spend less. I mean, it's so obvious that we almost kind of skip over it. But think about you know, the frugal days that right after college or whatever, when you got your first home. I, I bet you your your life was just as happy or very similar to what it is today. Uh, I think you still did some wonderful things, but you didn't have the money, so you lived within your means. Uh, but as money grew, so did the way we spent money. The interesting thing is that as money's contracted, its availability of money, our, our lifestyle again adjusts. So what we're doing in business, when we take our profit first, we are forcing our business lifestyle to live within certain constraints. And sure enough, it will adjust and it won't be any worse of a business. It won't be struggling because there's less money. It will just adjust just like we do in our life. It'll just be it's just as happy. But the beautiful part is now you've reserved profit for yourself, which goes into your pocket. Yeah, you know, I just look at my life. I've got three cars and a motorcycle. I'm just one driver. I don't need yeah. three cars and a motorcycle, right? Well, yeah, I need the motorcycle. Everybody, yeah, needs yeah. everybody, everybody needs a motorcycle. I that. Yeah. <laughs> but it's it's you know we we just expand and we keep spending what uh, what we have. If you don't have it, you know one of the most interesting and, and best lessons I've ever learned uh, in business. I when I moved to Atlanta 25 years ago, um, I was part. I was risk manager for a global pipe, uh, pulp and paper company. And I reported no. into uh, purchasing. Now, for a pulp and paper uh, company, uh, purchasing was an $800 million a year uh, group or, or uh, division. Uh, that that yeah. was their purchases for the year. And I remember the head of purchasing worldwide. He would have these meetings every quarter, and we would go and try to figure out, okay, how to save more money for the company, right? Mm -hmm. And the first meeting I ever saw him um, conduct, he said, I don't want you to try to figure out how to save 2%, 5%, or 10% on what we're currently spending. 
I want you to look at all your expenditures from last year and figure out what you don't need to buy because the best mm. way to make an impact on the expense line is not to negotiate 10% off, just decide not to buy it. Yeah. You know, and I, I was totally like, agree. wow. And it's like, you know, we're, sometimes we're, we're trying to figure out how to do the pennies. And when we look and go, do we really need that new copy machine? Do we really need that new piece of equipment? Uh, I remember he, he took it as far as saying, how come we have to provide pens for our employees? <laughs> <laughs> you know what's interesting, though, is it also per, is, that stops the cycle. Once you stop yes. buying, yes. it doesn't come back. When you cut by 10%, there's still a sense of obligation the next year and the next year and the next. So I like that approach a lot. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't want to give the audience a, a misconception that Profit First is about going in there and slashing the expenses. That That is something that you should look at. But Profit First is just figuring out how to pay yourself first. You've heard it all the time. Pay yourself first. Take yeah. that money. Don't let it go back into the business. Everybody's interested in success. However, only a few are really committed to it. What's the difference? Those that are committed are willing to do whatever it takes in order to get their outcome, in order to get their goals. If you're not getting the results you need and want, chances are it's accountability. Who's holding you accountable? I've got a challenge for you. For one month, 30 days, and $95, our team will hold you accountable for what you said you were going to get done in that month to get your goals, get your outcomes done. If, at the end of 30 days, you don't like the results or you just didn't like the system, we'll give you your money back. The question is, are you interested or are you committed? Keep an eye out for part three of our interview with Mike, where he tells us the four Ds of business including one that everyone overlooks, in addition to why productivity isn't the key to freedom in your business. See you next time on Peak Performers Podcast. <laughs>